Hello, everyone. I'm Mohamed Tabakoli, the inaugural director of the Iranian Studies at the University of Toronto. I welcome you all to the first session of the fall 2023 virtual seminar series, Persian Second Language Pedagogy, New Trends and Innovation. The series is co-organized by Professor Kune Shabani Jadidi of the University of Chicago and Professor Azita Talagani of the University of Toronto. Persian Second Language Pedagogy is co-hosted and co-sponsored by the University of Chicago's Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilization and the Center for Middle Eastern Studies in the University of Toronto's Department of Near and Middle Eastern Civilization. And we are grateful for their support. I'm also thankful to the Roshan Cultural Heritage Institute for generously funding the establishment of the Elahe Yarmi Jalali Institute of Iranian Studies at the University of Chicago. At the outset, I'd like to express our collective gratitude to Canada's indigenous people and acknowledge this land on which the Elahe Yarmi Jalali Institute of Iranian Studies operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Vandals, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of Credit River. Today, this meeting place continues to be the, the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to live, learn, and teach on their ancestral homeland. Professor Azita Talagani, my exceptional colleague, will introduce our speaker and moderate today's session featuring Professor Ali Abbasi of the University of Maryland. Uh, Professor Talagan. Thank you very much, Professor Tavakoli. I also welcome uh, all of you uh, for uh, by coming to this uh, lecture series. This is the second lecture series on Persian second language pedagogy. And uh, we are very excited uh, to uh, start again a new series in fall 2023. We are very grateful for the support of the Elahe Omidyar Mir Jalali Institute of Iranian Studies, and specifically its director, Professor Mohammad Tabakoli Targi, and all the sponsoring units. Um, I welcome uh, Professor Ali Reza Abbasi, who is an associate professor of uh, Persian at the School of Languages, Literatures, and Cultures, University of Maryland, to the University of Toronto, and to all lecture sets. Professor Abbasi trained as an applied linguist. His primary research interests include second language writing, discourse analysis, and teaching Persian to speakers of other languages. Some of his uh, publications uh, have appeared in such journals uh, like uh, Journal of Second Language Writing, uh, English for Specific uh, Purposes, Journal of Language and uh, Politics, and International Journal of Applied uh, Linguistics. My friend and colleague, Professor Puni Shabani Jadidi, will moderate today's session on uh, discourse markers in Persian, description, and instructional implications. Please join me welcome Professor Abbasi to our lecture series. Professor Abbasi. Hello, everybody. Thank you for taking time out and being here on this Saturday. I really appreciate it. I would like to thank uh, my colleagues, Dr. Talagani, Dr. Pune Shahwani Jadidi, and Dr. Tabakoli for um, organizing th this uh, series of talks that um, are very informative and I'm sure will contribute to uh, the um, uh, betterment of teaching Persian to speakers speakers of other languages. Uh, before I go into details of my talk, I'd like to take this opportunity and uh, express uh, my solidarity with um, our academic colleagues in Iran who are being purged, dissident academics, that is. Um, um, and 
I would also um, want to note that the talk that I'm presenting today is based on a research that I have uh, um, reported in a upcoming book uh, titled Discourse Markers in Persian, Actions and Practices in Talk and Interaction. So <clears throat> in the next um, 30 minutes or so, um, I am going to be talking about discourse markers, their descriptions, and instructional implications uh, to speakers of other languages. Now, discourse markers uh, are a group of language objects or elements that are very um, prevalent in spoken in Persian, both formal and informal. They are um, semantically empty, most of them, or semantically bleached, um, you know, items or objects such, such as ho, dige, ahe, ke, so on and so forth. One um, feature of, of discourse markers is that they are optional and hence dispensable, that is, we can ignore them, delete them without detriment to the well-formedness of utterances. Now, the question is, if these elements are semantically empty and play no um, grammatical role, why do users use them? So we know that from studies in other uh, languages that uh, these small elements are prevalent because they serve interactional purposes. They are not insignificant epiphenomena or idiosyncratic turns of phrases. They do certain things in talk and interaction. We know that their use in by um, speakers, second language speakers, contribute to their um, speech natu naturalness and fluency. We know that, for instance, students who have been um, studied, who have studied abroad and have been in the target culture for mm, a significant period of time, um, use them more frequently and their speech is more natural. But the problem is that many L2 learners across languages, not just Persian, tend not to use them as frequently as L1 users. We, can, we will get to the reasons of, of, of this. So if we recognize that they are important and do interactional work, the first challenge, and, and wanna incorporate them into our curriculum, um, we need, um, reliable descriptions. And one challenge that we have with respect to discourse markers in Persian is that uh, not, not much work has been done on them. There, there have been you know, uh, work, uh, studies done on, for instance, dige, uh, ke, and I think yani. And some of the existing descriptions are methodologically questionable. And we can discuss why uh, they are um, questionable and, and therefore unreliable. So if we decide to investigate discourse markers, there are basically two theoretical lenses. One is a pragmatic lens and one is a conversation analytic lens. So the pragmatic lens is from the discipline of linguistics. It focuses on utterances as actions. It uh, privileges speaker meanings or intentions. It admits armchair and naturally occurring data. Um, I, Again, this is important, I emphasize that. It, it focuses on speaker or analyst ascription of actions and intentions. 
in the second theoretical frame uh, um, theory, conversation analytic lens, it, it comes from sociology and it, it comes from a, a, a strand in sociology called ethnomethodology, which comes from philosophy, from um, phenomenology. It focuses on utterances uh, or turns that talk as social actions. And when we talk about social actions, we are basically talking about both the listener and speaker. And we are also talking about sequences of actions. So we, in this lens, we focus on speaker actions in conjunction with listeners fitted action to prior speakers action. So it's both listener and speaker, speaker and listener. It admits only naturally occurring talk. It could be mundane or everyday talk or institutional forms of talk. It focuses on interlocutors displayed understanding of each other's actions through a, a, a procedure called next turn proof pr procedure. Basically, uh, it focuses on members understanding of each other act each other's actions. We cannot put words into the mouth of members. That is, it's doggedly empirical. A, a core key principle in this um, lens is the principle of members orientation. We can only accept what members are orienting to. No aspect of talk can be dismissed a priori as irrelevant or trivial. Therefore, such Details of talk, like, such as silences, delays, laughter, in-breaths, partial repeats, and so on and so forth, become very important, and they need to be taken into account. For this reason, CA transcription is highly theoretically laden. It's very different from normal transcription of talk. And another key feature of this lens is that it regards talk as a very methodic and orderly. It assumes that there is order at every point in talk. So <clears throat> given this description, I tend to argue that CA, a CA lens, a CA lens gives us a very um, good, productive and complete, more better um, lens um, to investigate discourse markers compared to its rival lens, pragmatics. I have to add that there are overlapping um, aspects between pragmatic, the pragmatic lens and conversation and, al and analytic lens, but they are fundamentally different. So if we adopt the CA lens and CA is basically about uncovering the machinery of talk. And so far, four major um, structures of um, 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 talk and interaction have been recognized. One is the turn-taking organization. Basically, it's about tacit norms and members' methods for taking turns and talk. It's about the economy of terms. It is about repair organization. This is another uh, structure of talk. Again, norms and methods for resolving problems of speaking, hearing, and understanding. Another one is sequence organization. Again, methods and norms for initiating and jointly prosecuting courses of action or social action through talk. The last main organization is preference organization. And this is a technical term different from you know, uh, desires and wants of mm, individuals. And it means norms and members' methods for formatting alternative responsive, responsive actions. I can get into the, the details of these more, but in the interest of time, just you know, run quickly. If you're interested, there is um, 
a very you know good book by uh, the, one of the founding fathers of CA, Shell Law, that uh, you can refer to. So uh, let's take a look at uh, descriptions of two uh, discourse markers. You now, th these descriptions have been done through the lens of pragmatics. Um, so one is a uh, on a most prevalent discourse marker in Persian, Khob. So Qazian and Rezaei um, have examined Khob in the speech of bilingual Armenian American speaker, uh, Persian speakers and have come up with, I think, seven or eight uh, functions for Khob. Aram and Mishkin Farm have come up with four. Another work uh, done by, by our colleague Sheikh Sang Tajan um, come up with a discourse elaborative function for it. And a, a more recent work by Qadiri, you know, we are uh, uh, given a whole um, slew of, of functions. So we immediately we realized that this um, single syllable language object, hope, must be very uh, baffling and, and complex. But as I said, there are some methodolo methodological issues with some of these um, um, action or functional ascriptions. I can get into why, but again, I, I you know, try to stay within my time. So I'm saying that if we take a conversation say, a CA look at hope and basically situate hope in sequences and turns, we can come up with very parsimonious, I mean, short, shorter um, descriptions of these markers and that are that are structural. And I would argue more empirically defensible. So before I you know go into uh, the analysis of hope from the ACA lens, it's important to say that um, in the investigation of discourse markers, it is common practice to look at uh, these elements in terms of their location within a sequence. And a sequence, a base sequence, a basic sequence, that is a minimum course of action, consists of a first action, a second action, a responsive turn or action, and a third um, action. So in a minimal question and answer sequence, uh, we are seeing a first and second. I'm sure you have all seen this Mm, iconic interview where we see a first and second action, a question and answer. If you listen to it, so first action, question, response, second. In a minimally expanded sequence of, of a base uh, um, sequence, we are, we can see first, second, and third actions. Example, here. A question, response, and and an acknowledgement. So, so basically we have the first action, we have the second response, and the uh, third action, acknowledging receipt of response. So the third action is optional. Right. So now, oh, sorry. So now, if we if we situate hope in sequence and turns, we see that sometimes hope occurs in first position. This is the 
the most salient and recognizable um, position of hope and um, uh, uh, salient and therefore learnable um, function of hope. It is always, we see that it is always prepositioned to the initiating term. And it performs a dual action of trans transition from a previous sequence to a new sequence. It, it never initiates a sequence. And it has a distinct prosody. It's a falling intonation, which makes it distinct, you know, uh, salient and learnable. Now, I, I, I have lots of examples, but again, in the interest of time, I can go back to these and play if you're interested in the QA part of, of the talk. Um, so we also see that hope sometimes is um, active in second position as a turn component. It is, it is prepositioned to the responsive turn and it functions as a, as a first alert that a disaligning second action is on its way to be issued. So what, what, what do I mean? Just as an example, if we look at example three, we see that uh, we, are, we see a request sequence and the response to a, a request, first action, is either an, uh, accept, or accept or decline. So there's a typo here. Now, we see that hope is active when the responsive turn is this preferred or declined. Now, again, just for uh, uh, showing this in action, I would like you to listen to this um, extract. So uh, always, because you know of uh, the nature of speech, we need to transcribe it. So, um, so, so we have here. Um, sorry, sorry, in wrong transcription. So, so here we, we see a first action request, a second disaligning action declining the request. We see that hope prefaces a turn that implements a, a decline, dec declining of the request. Uh, hope in second position sometimes prefaces um, answers to questions where the question, first action, projects a wide range of possible responses. So, the, the the first action question projects hope. Now I would like you to listen to this example. Uh, so that in all the So Hope prefaces a, a response that is one response among many possible answers. So to understand this, if there was only one response possible, for instance, if the question was when Israel and Egypt establish diplomatic relations, hope is unlikely to, to occur. It would be, it would be, uh, it's not, it's, it's not possible. Or if I ask you genuinely what time it is, and you know, you, hope. It cannot be deployed there. So hope sometimes occurs in third position. Uh, in in a in a in a in a in a role that I have uh, referred to it as a, as this disjunctive hope. 
when the recipient resume responding. What do I mean by this? So a first action makes relevant a second relevant action. So the second action is always uh, immediately relevant. If the nextness of, uh, of first action and second action are disrupted for any reason, when the disruption comes to an end and the recipient goes back to the first action, we see hope is deployed. As, a, as an example, uh, listen to this. So let's take a look at the, 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 the transcription. So the, this is the first action question. This is a repair sequence that intervenes between the first action and the third and the, and the second action, which is, which, is, which is the response. So before the recipient responds, he needs to understand the question and, 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 and he, he initiates a repair sequence. When the repair sequence is finished and the recipient, the man, start, starts responding to the question, we see hope in action. This is a structural explanation or description of hope. And I, 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 I think very empirical. Um, now, let's take a look. Let's take a look at another um, marker, the case of K. So K has been investigated quite a bit uh, for its grammatical uh, role. But I'm arguing that Ke is a dis discourse marker in, in one incarnation of it, of it. And it is active in first and second positions only. In first position, in question answer sequences, it is an epistemic marker. It marks speaker's knowledge state. Structurally, it functions to solicit, that is to prefer agreement with speaker. It performs interactional work it's implicated in identity work as well. And it is structural organizationally restricted. That is, it cannot happen at the, at the start of an episode of talk. The interlocutors need to have established some shared uh, interactional history. As an example, um, Let's listen to a to an interview with a man at a cosmetic clinic in Tehran. First, listen, and then I I show the transcription. Just listen to get the con the, the context. <laughs> والا حقیقت هم ما رو آوردن به دستور آقای لشکری و حالا به خاطر محبتی که آقای دکتر تبا تبایی نسبت به ما داشته چند این بار اومدیم خدمتون حالا تو من یه چیزی بگم این کش دیگی را مخصوان آقای لشکری زید So So here We have A, a First action Or series of action uh, Turn The uh, reporter starts with a question. This is one question. This is a repair of the question in terms of its of epistemic status. And this is again another, a third act, a action within the same term. A term can involve more than one action. So we have this action. This is a question. This is a repaired version of this um, action. And this one is another repair of this action. Now, what do I mean by this? The first action, this is a question that is designed for a um, 
by a, by an unknowing um, um, speaker with zero knowledge. The question has been formatted for for any recipient, we got male, female, child, or, or, or adult, right? The, this action has been epistem uh, epistemically repaired in the sense that K is deployed to, to uh, indicate that the speaker is half certain some knowledge, but he's uncertain. Why is that? Because he's speaking to a man and he is orienting to the notions of masculinity prevalent in, 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 in Iran, perhaps. So the turn is repaired, the action is repaired for a male recipient. And then, so we have the, the speaker, the um, reporter, starts with total lack of knowledge, genuine question designed for any recipient. It is modified. He has some knowledge, but he's not unsure. He knows that men are not typically doing this, or this is his assumption, uh, because he's talking to a man, an athletic man. And so we have zero knowledge, some knowledge, and certain knowledge, full knowledge. That's an right. So this is in in this sense this is um, an epistemic marker the question projects an agreement and the agreement is implemented by the response right we see that k is is also in second position is a turn design feature of this preferred second actions across all sequences except certain assessment sequences. For instance, the response to criticism, if it's accept, so let me rephrase. So the response to a criticism could be either accept or reject. If it's reject, care is, is deployed. Listen to this. So the interviewer is basically criticizing the power company official, the official responds by not accepting. We see K is deployed. So um, the same in response to informing telling. So any, any informing or telling makes relevant some appreciation, typically news mark. And by news mark, I mean, really, JD. Uh, any non-appreciation second action is this preferred? We see K is deployed in in this preferred responses to tellings. Again, example. Listen. That's excellent. Okay, I want to have that. I got choose you. I mean, to have that. So, So. Mankemidunam is a non-appreciation of the telling. If it was a, a preferred response, would have been JD indicating that the telling was newsworthy. So K is active in 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 first assessments where the first action is self-deprecation. So typically, uh, responses to First assessments are agreement. Right? But if the, the first assessment is understood as self-deprecation, we see K is deployed. 
Listen to this example by, with, a, um, by a, with a former Afghan official. So, so uh, the man is saying that I'm old. The woman says, you're not old. So self-deprecation, we see K is a flaw. So K is a feature, turn design feature of in, in, in this, this particular sequence, uh, feature of preferred responses. In, in all other uh, assessment sequences, that's not the case. So K in second position, we see that it's, it's involved or implicated in the organization of repair. And repair can be done in the same term by, this, by the current speaker or by, uh, by, by uh, uh, re recipient. So an example. So this is an example. If you, I would like you to to read this, and then listen to the um, to the recording. <laughs> So man ke mariz mariz ahvalam man mariz ahval ke na so ke targets the repairable what needs to be repaired we see this in this repair organization self repair self correction uh, or it can be done by the recipient listen to this um, um, interaction یعنی خرابا رو میذارید ریسیپین خراب که نه که attaches to what is needs to be repaired so it, it's it implicated in the organization of repair in Persian as a, as, as, a mar, as a discourse marker so just running quickly through this so what are the instructional implications of, of these descriptions so the first thing is that we as practitioners need to be aware that discourse markers are complex and they do interactional work. They are not idiosyncratic turns of phrases again, trivial. They need to they need to be in, uh, attended to. They merit attention in in L2 in any L2 curriculum. We need to be aware that learners are already competent conversationalists in their L1s. They are not deficient on that front, they can transfer the universal feature of conversational machinery from their L1 to L2. They just need fine tuning of their L1 conversational norms for Persian. If I want to use the Chomskyan term, they need to set their parameters for Persian. Examples could be in, for instance, Taro. If a learner is interacting with a Persian speaker who that Persian speaker happens to orient to Tarof, meaning that the fir a first um, offer should be declined and accepted when it is offered a second time. You know, they, know, they need to be aware of this norm and, you know, um, be uh, competent in that way. And they need to acquire basically, the Persian language resources to um, implement corresponding action and practices in Persian. So that's the, that's the major part, with some fine-tuning of norms. So in terms of some options, instructional strategy options, 
addressing them implicitly are very challenging due to the to their nature. They are part of the ephemeral speech. They are often less salient. So we need to have a explicit uh, strategy to address them. One of them, I think, is to start with the uh, with the learners' first language. We need to make them aware of their workings in in English, for instance. We see that in the case of uh, disjunctive quote, we see that in in English as well. Listen to this: a question is interrupted by a re repair sequence. And we see that well is deployed when Fauci goes back to responding to the question. Listen to this. Dr. Fauci, look back and, and reflect and tell me, how would you do it differently with regard to kids? I am of the opinion that we erred on the side, this is probably inartfully said, of physical health, not emotional health. And, and, and that putting our, our kids within parameters in the pandemic was not in their best interest. Do you share that perception? And if not, why? So, Michael, are you referring to the closing of schools? And Repair the sequence. Impact yes. That has on development yes. And mental health. Yeah, I am. Well, certainly. Well deployed. Yeah. Well, we would deal so with if, if, we need, if you look at, uh, at the transcript, <clears throat> this is the, basically the question. This is this is a insert sequence that disrupts the nextness of respond of answer to question we see the question here we see an intervening repair sequence Fauci needs to understand the question before being able to answer the question right and then when the sequence is over the insert sequence we see if well is deployed the same function for hope we see in with well. So that's the first step that we can have as you know, raising consciousness about these well, the workings of well and so forth in learners first language. So with the tsunami that was the same earlier when when a question projects answer and answer is not given we see well is deployed. Listen, yeah, listen to this. Yeah, okay, can. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is. I'm not sure. What's wrong here? All right. Um, and I have to run to to the other items. So there are other many many um, trans um, strategies that we can explicitly address th them um, um, that I don't go into now. If you're interested, I can you know, go back to them. And, and we can get inspirations um, by listening to authentic samples of talk interaction and, and create uh, uh, scenarios for role plays in order to you know, teach them. As you know, um, coming up with uh, scenarios are, are very difficult, and I think authentic um, data can give us inspiration on how to come up with scenarios and address these. And because teaching needs to be followed by assessment, sorry, we can use basically the same stuff to um, assess um, discourse markers, the learning of discourse markers. And thank you so much for your time. I know I, I you know, went over my time limit. I apologize for that. Thank you so much, Arijan, for this very interesting and um, rare study. So I really appreciate it. There is so much room to be done on pragmatics and teaching pragmatics in Persian. I know that uh, the studies are not too many. Okay. So thank you for this timely talk. Um, now I'm going to say a few words about the outline of what Ali said so that um, questions will be inspired in your minds if they are not there already. So Ali talked about the discourse markers in Persian, their descriptions, as well as their instructional implications. As for descriptions, he said that they appear both in formal Persian and in informal Persian. 
He said that they are semantically empty or bleached. I have a question there, but maybe later. He said that they're optional. He said they serve interactional purposes. They contribute to fluency and naturalness. And they are not so frequent in L2 speech. And that is why he's trying to, um, to, to recommend that we actually do teach them in our classes. He said that um, as far as teaching is concerned, this is a little bit challenging because of lack of studies in discourse markers, as well as methodologically questionable and unreliable um, studies or um, material that we have at hand. He talked about two theoretical lenses in these studies, pragmatic as well as conversation analysis. Pragmatic is usually linguistics and conversation analysis is in the domain of sociology. And he said the conver conversation analysis is a better lens to look at these discourse markers. And they appear in only in natural speech. Um, he talked about conversation analysis um, being talking interactions and they have some kind of organization. Uh, he mentioned four of these organizations, turn taking, which is economy of turns, repair, sequence, and preference. He gave us some examples. Case one was Khob, and he said this is the, there are many, several studies that he showed us. Some of them give a lengthy list of functions, different functions of Khob. And um, uh, he said that there is a base sequence for Khob and for actually any of these um, discourse markers, first position, second position, and third position. Some of these discourse markers don't have the third position, but hope does. So first position is the most salient one, he said. Second position is uh, the turn component, and the third position is optional, and it's usually for resuming responding. And um, then he talked about K, which was his second case. And um, he said that usually it doesn't happen in the third position, it happens in first or second. The first one is usually epistemic and the second is interactional. And it's in response to um, um, you know, informing or self-deprecation or a repair of, the, uh, of speaker one's statement. Then eventually um, the, he talked about the instructional implications of um, discourse markers. He said, because they are universal and they also exist in different languages, probably we better start with a learner's first language, discourse markers. And uh, he said that there are different options to teach these um, discourse markers. He said we can, as he said, we can start with a learner's L1. We can have transcriptions, um, exercises, having gaps and all sorts of um, other exercises that he mentioned, as well as scenario-based uses of DM. And, um, and at the end, he talked about the assessment of DM because uh, no teaching is complete without assessment. So with that, I would like to take your questions and if we have time, then I will ask mine. So Mahvashan, you're next. At first, I have to thank Ali John to, uh, for solving a big problem for me, because in my teaching of uh, 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 grammar, when it uh, came to this kind of K, I didn't have any clue what that K would be. For example, manke ahli in kar nistam, manke, ya ke intor, ya ke gofti, so <laughs> I am really indebted to Ali to solve that problem for me, and I am so much uh, looking forward to read his, uh, his book. But I want to ask him if I am correct in uh, after listening to his uh, speech, that they are care of discourse uh, marker. Ali, is that right when we said ke intor? 
is it uh, correct and it's in what, which position? Would you please tell me that? Uh, Dr. Sh Shoyed, uh, thank you very much for being here and thank you for the encouraging words. The first, as a CA analyst, I have to say in what sequence? This cane tour is, is response, is first position, is second position, first, uh, first position, second position, third position. What, what sequence is it in? Okay, uh, probably it's in response. For example, somebody is uh, telling you something and at the end you would say K-intor means right. that you're... Uh, uh, yes, yes, I understand. So, so it all depends on the sequence. The way you are um, situating the scene is that the first action we are we're dealing with a telling sequence or informing sequence. Any informing or telling sequence makes relevant appreciation of some kind. Usually in Persian, we say jedi, nababa, rasti. Any other action would be this preferred. So ke, ke tor, is a dispreferred action that does not acknowledge the newsworthiness of the telling. So that's my analysis of. of Okay, in very good. Position. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, bergeşti, means uh, accepting um, the statement that the um, uh -huh. uh, speaker is saying. Is that right, right Ali? Bergeşti, uh, uh, it's just uh, uh, examples that came to my mind. Right. Right. Well, well, well. I have to say that um, we need natural speech. The way you are saying it, Kintor, is a is a is a. Um, uh, I'm I'm just searching. Is it for preferred her. response? No, no. no. It, it it's um, suggesting a topic to be. It's proposing a topic for talk. Oh, okay. Right? Okay. So th th this is the first action that's, uh, that proposes a topic to be adopted by the recipient. The recipient oh. may adopt it or may not. Very good. Very good. I don't want to take uh, your time right. uh, more than that, but I have another question. And what would be the punctuation for this discourse marker, Ali? The punctuation. Uh, um, I'm not really following. What, what exactly do you mean? Could you elaborate? Okay, when you say hope and then you start the rest of your uh, response, what kind of punctuation do you do we need to use? Is it ex exclamation mark, comma? Well, because because we are we are dealing with speech, these are all uh, features of written text. So okay. if, you look, uh, if you look at a truly CA transcript, it's very inaccessible, you know, it, it, uh, they incorporate or take into account a lot of features of talk, you know, okay. falling, rising, pauses, laughters, gaze direction, mm -hmm. bodily movements, multimodality, because, because if I address you, for instance, I, I direct my gaze. And this is a strategy to select the next speaker, you know? Okay. So it, it, it's complicated, you know? <laughs> okay. okay. And, but methodic <laughs> and orderly. That's that's the key term. Uh, okay. Pro okay. Probably, Mahvashan, for the punctuation, maybe Ali can correct me, but you can refer to novels where um, there are dialogues within. And I mm -hmm. think that is one, one place to look at. The, con the punctuations, what Ali said, th these are conversational, so it's a little bit dif different. Um, yeah, but yeah. To, in transcription, you know, when you transcribe it, you need yeah. punctuation, don't you? Yeah, when exactly. When you transcribe. Exactly. That's where you can look at what other people okay. do with novels. Thank you so much, Mahvajan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Ali. You're welcome. Okay, thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Abbasi, for opening this door. 
uh, not only for um, those who are teaching Persian language, even for linguists. These are uh, for a long time, unfortunately, perhaps uh, in English, there are some works in discourse and pragmatics of these uh, uh, forms, but unfortunately not in Persian, in uh, pragmatic in Persian, because uh, honestly, there are not so many people working on pragmatic aspects of Persian. Uh, but um, this is very, very uh, good news that uh, we see that uh, uh, you have a book and we can um, use it in future, not only for more classes, also for learning more about uh, these kinds of discourse uh, markers. Honestly, uh, we always have a problem with markers in linguistic and discourse is uh, totally different. So my first question is, uh, I wish we had time that you can uh, more elaborate about uh, the implication, instructional implication. Um, my question is that, you know, uh, when we uh, deal with uh, uh, discourse marker, some of the discourse mar marker between L1 and L2 are uh, similar and uh, correspond to each other and are very easy, like any other uh, linguistic aspect to teach. Mm -hmm. But uh, what about those kinds of discourse marker that you have in L1 language of the students, but not in L2? For example, uh, we have some uh, uh, stuff in Persian, uh, discourse marker in Persian that we do not have exactly the same as a conversational um, uh, form in uh, English. What do you suggest as an instructor if we want to teach these kinds of discourse marker that the students get the um, context that they use. Uh, what do you suggest? Thanks so much for your uh, kind words and encouraging words. Um, so one example is the very um, discourse marker K. K is, is not, um, has not a corresponding marker in, in English. Exactly. So this is something unique to Persian and it can easily be taught um, through, you know, just like any um, language form that we teach. You know, it's not um, we 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 can cr create scenarios and you know address you know uh, uh, it works based on authentic speech. You know, we can we can we can we can expose them to authentic speech and target care. In no. that way, uh, they're, they're going to notice and hopefully acquire. Their... And then you uh, go in a way that you, fall, because we have different care in, uh, you know, uh, you know, discourse and also in grammar, then you differentiate this based on the different context that you bring in conversation, natural language, and then in grammar, you try to, uh, you know, differentiate them, uh, that how do they work, yeah? I, I guess so, yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, no. So this is a, this is a language form that's similar to other forms are, are, uh, acquirable, so to speak, you know, just like any other forms, it, <laughs> unique, unique to Persian. Mm -hmm. We need to just uh, make learners conscious of them so that they can notice and hopefully acquire it. So as we know, <laughs> acquisition, the prerequisite to acquisition is noticing and attention. We mm -hmm. need to make, bring this to the attention of learner. The learner will sort it out. Mm -hmm. The learners are very capable. Yeah, I know, I know. Thank you so much. My second question is that because, you know, Persian is an intonational language, and I believe that for the specifically uh, with respect to hope and uh, uh, and K, that we have different kind of K. Intonation is very important, and because you are working on the conversational um, analysis, uh, how much in, in discourse and conversational analysis you focus on the intonational aspects of these discourse markers? So they are certainly um, consequential. You know, they are related to the functions of markers, and they need to be addressed. Just like any other forms, it's a form. Meaning is encoded into into intonation, as you know. Uh, so we can address this just like again. I'm repeating myself. 
as we address any other, you know, issues of pronunciation. Mm. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Azita Jan. Um, maybe I can ask a question now that I don't see another hand up. Um, Ali, you talked about when you were talking about Khob and you were talking about the first position of Khob. Um, you said that the first position is the most salient one. Therefore, it is more learnable. I was a bit confused there. How? I mean, what makes something more salient, more learnable? Um, and then also, what did you do? How did you find that it was more salient? Did you do some kind of a, a st empirical study on it? Or it's just um, your native speaker yeah, that's talking the then? Point. Thank you. So I said salient because of its prosody. It's hope. Distinct from the rest of the term. Whereas if you listen carefully to instances of hope that are somehow attached to the turn, hope is less salient phonologically, phonetically. So in that sense, it's less salient, right? And because anything that is more salient or more noticeable, and because it's more noticeable, they're, they're more, uh, they're primed for acquisition. That's that's the principle in SLA, second language acquisition. We learn, acquire something if we notice and attention, pay attention to it. We don't learn without paying attention to, to things. In this case, hope. So because it's cross, uh, in terms of pronunciation, distinct, in fact, I can play um, samples of L2 uh, um, speech as learners playing backgammon, you will notice that they frequently deploy hope in first position, but not in other positions. This is because, this is uh, an empirical question. This is because, and I, I think my hunch is that it's more salient. It's more salient in the data. It's more salient in the speech of teachers because as managers in the classroom, they frequently deploy hope when they move from one sequence, instructional sequence to another. So it's more salient, they, they learn it. But they 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 do not deploy hope, disjunctive hope. I have other forms of hope. I am in, in the book I have elaborated. We have co-optive hope, where hope is implicated in a practice where the speaker co-opts the listener in the action that he or she wants to implement. We have um, consequential hope. When a preferred second action is noticeably missing, we see hope is deployed in the third position. So learners, because this is, this is very opaque, even for speakers of the language, let alone learners of, of the language who are dealing with other aspects of the language, you know, hope, uh, optional hope, optional care. These are optional, right? They are less salient. They're, they're focused on the propositional meaning of the utterance, you know? Yeah. That's that's the reason. Thank you so much. Um, one more thing just to follow up on that. So you also said that they are these um, discourse markers are um, semantically bleached. Can we say that for all of them, or can you say that some of them, like for example, manke nonagoftam, but I didn't say that. Like that could be like a contrastive, you know, um, meaning in it that makes it different from. So it's not, it's not completely semantically bleached, right? We can't say that for all the DMs. Certainly, we cannot talk about uh, use that term. But K in the, in the example that you mentioned, uh, the, the, the contrastive function of K is not the property of K, it's the property of the sequence. So K in that position is a feature of turn design, right? It's not inherent in, in K. So another form, hala. Hala is, a, is, a, is an adverb, but as a discourse marker is a is a um, um, shift marker, right? 
It doesn't mean now. So, so ho. Another prism. Discourse markers are not always lexical items. Uh, it is a marker, marker of repair. If if I want to repair something, I project it for the to, in order to display to my listener that what is what what what, what is what co is coming next is a repair action. So k is not a, in, in no dictionary. They say k uh, eh, but it, you know it's a, it's a marker. It's interesting so, that you mentioned. Sorry? Yeah, sorry. Uh, so so uh, yeah. is not inventory in, in any dictionaries, mm -hmm. but it does interactional work of marking upcoming or incipient repair. Mm -hmm. Or just as a gap filler, right? Like, for example, in English, they would say, um, right? In Persian, we would say, eh. Once actually, that's my other question for you. Like, when do you start, when do you suggest beginning teaching um, DMs in, in our Persian classes? Like in first year, if the students is saying, um, right? I ask them to change, because I'm very conscious of these DMs too. So I ask them to change it, to replace it with A, and it actually, you know, helped them uh, sound more natural, more fluent. But I was wondering what you suggest, like, what is the more scientific answer to when to start teaching these? Uh, well, I can, you know, suggest some, some options. I think, first of all, I think that we, we need to address discourse markers right from start. Mm -hmm. And we need to expose learners to authentic speech right from the earliest. Let, let me bring up um, the teaching of um, hope, accountable hope. This is another <laughs> function of hope that I have referred to as accountable hope. Let me just bring it up if sure. I have time. Um, sure. Mm, countable hope. Okay, so this is this is something that I suggest. You know, there are there are many ways to skin a cat, so to speak. But this is my way. So if we want to teach accountable hope, right? This is the information that we need to have as teachers, right? So sometimes hope happens not 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 prepositioned to turn but after response. And it, it retrospectively uh, qualifies the response, not the term, right? So we see the question here, the answer, and then hope, and then hope projects an account. It explains why the answer was given. So we, I refer to this as accountable, accountable hope. So this is an account for answer that hope projects. So we can immediately by ins inspire ourselves from authentic speech and come up with this very simple, you know, uh, right? All of these are um, markers except shayat. Now, now, so this can be used, you know, in 101, 102. That's true. Right? Yeah. So hope is hope is the thing. So another thing, if if hope is if, if if the account is not provided, the sequence is expanded as account solicited. Right? This is again part of that accountable hope. So soal, jawab, hope. Deploy Mishe, Bali account Dodenemishe. Recipient solicits the account. This is a recurrent hope implicated action. These are the ways we can, you know, easily turn into uh, instructional materials. Yeah, this is great. Is this part of your book? Yes. Okay, can't wait for it. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Thank Perfect. you. Perfect. So thank you so much for all your answers. Mahnia has her hand up. Mahnia. Yes, thank you so much uh, for your great presentation. It was really informative, and uh, for me, it was it was wonderful. I learned a lot, and thank you so much again for the organizers organizing this uh, series of lectures. Um, well, my question 
is about the way that we are looking at a discourse marker and what you suggested, for instance, as a discourse marker, like when we are looking at them and a filler word. So when we are talking in English, for instance, well, uh, we consider it as a filler and in advanced levels, it is suggested even not to use them a lot because it reduces kind of, you know, uh, the level of proficiency. While, um, well, in Persian language is kind of different, particularly when we are teaching the language. And so to what extent when we are like um, explaining this, uh, to what extent we can compare them with uh, filler words in uh, English? Well, again, I'm, I have to <laughs> give a CA answer. <laughs> the well uh, is not a matter of you know being proficient, mm -hmm. efficient. Uh, it's used by in all contexts, but very proficient in different contexts. Just to, again to give you an example, let me bring up um, I'm not sure I can hang on a second, please. Um, let me see if I can bring up. Um, Listen to this um, de deployment of well by a royal, a member of a royal family involved in a scandal. You seem utterly convinced you're telling the truth. Would you be willing to testify or give a statement on the oath if you were asked? Well, I'm like everybody else. I'm, I'm, Did I'm, you hear that? And, and I would have to take so, um, all the legal advice. A question is asked. Um, a question as as soon as a question is initiated or given an answer is preferred when the response is not the is an answer is just a response well is deployed this is a recurrent practice in english whether you're a president whether you're an academic so on and so forth this is the way we understand evasions by reference to these norms so it's it's part of teaching English. In the case of Hope, it's part of teaching Persian. They need to be addressed, you know, systematically, you know. Um, so arguments against them um, are, in, to my mind, problematic. Thank you. I work. Thank you so much. Any other questions, or we can give the floor back to Azita to close today's session. Thank you so much. We have some comments in the chat that uh, uh, specifically one of our um, um, uh, colleagues asked for the slides from uh, Dr. Abbasi. It is possible to have this slide, uh, um, Mohammad Farahoni, I think. Uh, and we have very good uh, comments also about Yani. Uh, as a, a discourse marker that um, I really appreciate that Ali John, you look at them and, uh, you know, uh, if you know these people, you know, I answer them through email because they're very, very good uh, comments about these um, kinds of uh, discourse marker. But um, I uh, really want to uh, thank you uh, for um, taking your time being uh, on Saturday in this uh, um, lecture series. Uh, I would uh, also want uh, to uh, thank you, my, my colleague, uh, Professor Pune Shabani Jadidi, for this wonderful uh, moderate, moderating the um, session and our speaker. Uh, I'm looking forward, and we all looking forward for uh, his uh, uh, book uh, comes out soon, and we um, uh, actually uh, benefit from that book in our classes and uh, for our knowledge. Thank you so much, um, uh, Professor uh, Abbasi, for this inspirational talk, informative talk, and uh, we hope that we uh, see all of you in um, uh, next. Uh, uh, I, I want to share if I can. Uh, in, in our next uh, lecture, it should be in uh, uh, October. Um, 
As you see, uh, we have another speaker, Dr. Reza Falohati, uh, talk about uh, relative difficulty in the acquisition of Persian velour stop by an uh, English speaker. So we are looking forward to see you all uh, uh, in uh, October, on October 7th, uh, for our uh, next uh, uh, talk uh, in um, Persian uh, second language. Uh, pedagogy. Uh, again, thank you for your attending, your comments, your question, and have a wonderful weekend. Uh, we just say bye um, until uh, next uh, lecture. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye. Right, likewise, thank you all. Bye. Bye.